It is now time to start with our second and very exciting plenary session with live surgery feeds from Budapest, Hungary and Torino, Italy, chaired by three amazing experts in implantology, and I'm going to present them to you. First of all, a periodontist and very experienced implant surgeon, Isabella Rocchietta. Next to her, a prosthodontist and also a very experienced surgeon, Ronnie Young. And then on my other side, one of the pillars underneath implant therapy, an icon in our field. We are very proud that he's here, Daniel Boozer. Thank you. Isabella, can you please introduce us to the session? Thank you, Garrett, and thank you all. It's, it's an extraordinary afternoon, and we don't have one life surgery. We have two life surgeries, and if I think about it, Garrett, in the past, this would have been something unbelievable and unachievable, whereas today we have two separate geographical locations with two extraordinary speakers who clearly do not need an introduction. Now, Ronnie, my co-chair, will certainly help me out with this. And uh, they will perform three-dimensional bone augmentation procedures in two different ways. So it will be very, very exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Ronnie. Uh Yes, Isabella, can I, I think you can hear my heart beating. Yes. I think this session we have so much look forward to. We had so much time spent to prepare, to prepare that, uh, yeah. uh, that afternoon. And also from the surgeon side, a big respect because that's always a big challenge doing this. So now we're going to start with introducing you to the first patient, the patient which will be operated in, um, in Torino by Mauro Rocuzzo. Mauro Guzzo is a periodontist, and he's really since a long time in business, and he's a, an amazing clinician. He's an amazing scientist. He does a lot of studies out of his uh, uh, practice, and he really had uh, some really very important uh, contribution in our dental field from a scientific and from a clinical point of view. Mario is going to treat a patient, a male patient, which underwent kind of a, a periotherapy. He joined the office uh, years ago, and uh, with really there was with poor oral hygiene, with uh, with not really a very good compliance. He didn't see the patient then for about two three years, and then he came back by the, uh, this year, and uh, he did he started then again the periodontal therapy, and had to extract a couple of teeth, including also the two centri incisors, which have been extracted in uh, April 2022. And you can see we have healthy conditions, but really the most delicate conditions. We have already recessions in the neighboring teeth. We have their attachment loss in the neighboring teeth, but we have a healthy tissue there. And he will show how he has used the digital technology to prepare the site by using a three-dimensional CAT CAM performed mesh, titanium mesh, and how this is going to be applied. And we're going to see all the details important, what is important related to that surgery. Now, we'd like to Go to the second patient, which is a patient uh, which will be treated by Istvan Urban. Istvan Urban is a superstar when it comes to bone augmentation. He's all over the world. He does a lot of courses, and uh, I know a lot of he has a, a large fan community. And it's so important now that we don't just see lectures, not see pictures, that we really can see what he's doing in his environment. So he will be doing a surgery of a female, 51-year-old uh, patient in uh, Budapest, where uh, he's doing a, a large augmentation there in the posterior area. Uh, interesting enough, the patient is, um, is a dental assistant, and uh, she lost her teeth when she was uh, 17 years old uh, due to really large decays. And we know, I have seen now, I received per WhatsApp already the, uh, the print, the uh, sc screenshots of the three-dimensional structure of the bone, and I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to be really a challenging case. And now we're going to do the first test, and uh, we would like to welcome Istvan. He's starting to warm up. I can see that. Istvan, can you hear us? Hi, Istvan. Excellent, hi, excellent. Hi, Isabella. Hi, Ronnie. Istvan, I think, with me and uh, Isabella and Danny and the whole audience, uh, together with Gary, all our hearts are beating. We are totally excited, and we are so much looking forward to that intervention. Maybe you can give us a little bit of uh, insight of the patient. Okay, so this patient, um, as, as you said, is 51 year old. Uh, I don't know if you can see the picture. She's had uh, extractions, and here's a 3D uh, model of her posterior jaw. As you can see, a little bit of a drops. It's more like a horizontal defect, but it's a little bit of a drop. So I'm going to do a little bit of a, 
a vertical ridge augmentation. The challenge here is obviously the nerve is really close and, uh, and it's very narrow. I'm going to use a conventional technique, but I just want to let you know that, I mean, it's a convention. I'm not going to use this membrane, but you can also pre-plan, you know, like your membranes, you know, according to uh, your guides and even produce guides that will allow you or facilitate you to uh, position the membrane, to fixate the membrane, okay? So I'm, I'm not going to use any of these. I just want to let you know that this is the patient and this is what we're going to do and we're going to use a conventional technique. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to do it. So what is your digital approach to that case, Istvan? So yeah, I don't know if you saw the picture or not, but you know, I had a 3D plan here. Do you see the picture or not? Yes, yes. we do. Okay, so this was the, the, uh, the 3D um, model. We have, we have um, so we're playing around with these guides, you know. And these guides are, are facilitating you to place the, the membrane. You can pre-cut your membranes based on this. Here's a membrane pre-cut. You can pre-cut it. I'm not gonna use any of these, okay? But like, that would make it easier, right? So anyway. Um, and you can even use this to, to fixate, but I think if you have a, a 3D model that is printed, you can have a template, how you want to you you cut your membrane, and that's already a big help. Perfect, okay, but excellent. But I'm not going to use that, so I'm just, Perfect, yeah. Excellent, thank you so much, Istvan, uh, from our side. So uh, we let you now start to work, and we try, now we'll try to go to Torino in order to welcome uh, Mario Rocuzzo. How are you? Excellent. Thank you, Mario. We are all happy when we see your faces. Also, the, uh, the technical part works, so it's, uh, the session is not just exciting from what we are doing, it's also exciting from the technical aspects. So, Mario, we already saw now the uh, three-dimensional video there. Maybe you want to add something to your patient today. Well, as you have seen, he's a periodontally compromised patient, young, so he was affected by the one called uh, aggressive periodontitis. Uh, it took me a while to put him uh, in a safe situation regarding the perio situation. So now he has uh, signs of periodontal disease, but there are no major pockets and the inflammation is under control. So the idea is to plan guided bone regeneration, but also to improve the situation of the teeth number 1-2 and 2-2. Now I have started already to collect bone from the lower left mandible using scrapers. So it was a full thickness flap, and just like when you have to extract a wisdom tooth, and with the scraper, you collect the bone. In this way, you're going to uh, collect uh, as much bone as you want. You just have to be patient, but you can collect really a huge amount of bone. And that's what I'm doing right now. Okay, Mario, thank you very much. I think we have to get into the details. Uh, in, in a few minutes. For the time being, we will let you prepare and relax. And I have a question to the pillar. He defined you as an ethic figure, which you are, of uh, implant therapy. Now, Danny, you must have had a lot of pressure throughout your career in uh, sustaining life surgeries, like our two gentlemen and two surgeons, professional colleagues there. What is it, from a human point of view, to have what is it, 2,000 people watching you, cameras, lights, and especially, does this influence your behavior towards the actual therapy? Yeah, I would say uh, we have done a lot of live searches in previous years where there was not a transmission to a conference hall 500 kilometers away because that is a completely different ball game. And I think that's the most challenging you can have because you need to have a good connection. You see the connection extremely fast. Uh, and you should not make too many mistakes because you have 2,000 people watching you. So I think it's a tremendous pressure you have as a surgeon, and we can only applaud these two guys that they take the pressure. Definitely. I think we're very lucky to have uh, such talented surgeons who, who can do this for, for us and for, for every member yeah. here. Excellent. So, uh, 
shall we... Yeah, I think, uh, Danny, if you join uh, Ronnie and Perfect. Isabella, I think uh, the surgeries are starting. Uh, we have good images, they tell me in my ear, so I think, uh, like a, a good sports match, I guess, you guys as experts are going to live comment on what you see, and let me also invite our live audience in the room. You can also submit, perhaps, questions if you want via the app dot eao dot org mobile website push interaction and uh, your questions end up right here on my desk Isabella what do you see I would like to connect to Budapest Budapest can you hear me the bone yes so can you please mm -hmm. describe the incision line you. and you are positioning yes. the incision within yes. the keratinized tissue can you please describe it to us please yes. So basically, the initial incision is very, very important. And I go in more or less in the middle of the keratinized tissue, but I do a three-step incision. The first step was I did a floating incision because it's so narrow and then you can, you can accidentally slip. So I did a floating incision, gently outlining the flap, then I went down, cut the periostom, and now I go with the curette. And I'm immediately two teeth away, I do a vertical, a vertical incision, and the length of the vertical incision is important. It's about 10 millimeters beyond the microgingival junction. And distally, my incision is not, may not be completely ready, or distally, I do a vertical incision that's going towards the coronary process right here. Section it. Going through the coronary, pro towards the coronary process. About here, I'm going to have to reinforce my incision over there. Reconnect a little bit. Isman, are you going to do a, also distally an additional releasing incision, or is it just kind of extending the uh, crestal incision? This is just an extension. It's, a vertical, it's, a, it's like a vertical incision, but it's just like an extension of the flap. It's very important that you not, don't cut into the retromolar pad, because retromolar pad is already too lingual. And, um, and it's close to the lingual nerve, so we're just going to go out here. I reinforce my incision, keep reinforcing my incision with like these little curettes to make sure that I have really went through down to the bone. See that one is a little bit of a, this little thing was not, yeah. And now I will start elevating the flap in the mesial. And I'm going to use this mini, mini instrument to elevate the mesial. We go to, shall we go to Mario okay. to see his incision? It's my mini-me. Say that again. Yes, let's, let's see what the, when, when he's coming to the, to the posterior part. I think that's an important part uh, yeah. to approach there from the mesial side. Because there you can better control that you're on the, on the level of the bone. So I think that's, uh, that's the idea of that. So you basically just use... For, for the first part, you use uh, a blade, and then you're also using the, depending on the, the, the size of the case, you're using a curette in order to elevate the flap. East one. Yeah, and now I go back to the curette. Yes, I go back to the curette now, and in the, in the posterior region, I don't even want to use a tissue um, like elevator, a periostal. I would like to elevate this, just peeling it off, because my primary incision was so pretty much perfect, that this should come off like this. See that? Yes. Yeah. And now, we now can my periosteum well is completely intact. We can see that very well I think it looks okay, very efficient. I go back to the mini-me. Yeah. And now I want to see the nerve, in this, which is here. Yeah. There's the mental foramen. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so it's pretty nice. We'll go all the way in the back, all the way in the back here. And then I start to elevate the lingual flap from the vertical incision. I'm going to go from the vertical incision. And now I elevate the lingual flap. What kind of instrument are you using for the lingual flap, this one? Yes, it's a great question. This is like a, a modified wood zone, which is, I call it the mini-me, because <laughs> I love it so much, so it's like, it's like me. And I just, I just um, 
went as as lingual as I can see now the myelohyoid muscles you can see here. Yes. Okay. The insertion. Of, I don't want to remove the myeloid muscles. So now we're at three steps. Three steps to elevate the lingual and advance the lingual flap. The first step. I'm going to use different pliers now. I go under the retromolar pad and I'm going to gently elevate this retromolar pad out. I tunnel and lift the retromolar pad. That's my first step. Then, can you guys see this? Yes, yes we can see so it very well. This is going to be a very important part of the surgery. Well. Okay, now I identify the myelohyde muscle and I gently push on the flap to separate the flap from the muscle. And this is the second zone, which we call the high myelohyoid attachment. Now, we just uh, did some studies on this anatomically, and, um, and you can see that it's a connective tissue that's really dense, and that's harboring this important anatomy, which is here. And again, I'm just going to reflect the flap from the muscle. This inserting muscle fibers, I don't disturb. And you can see here the lingual nerve running, the lingual nerve running in this dense connective tissue. It's very rare that you can see it so nicely. I think it's but I'm not afraid can see of it because I am, I am inside this dense connective tissue. I'm very, very uh, uh, you know, gentle with the tissue and I'm also very blunt with the tissue. And now I'm going to go more anteriorly. And you can see this flap is coming up, but I have to go a little bit more posterior here to lift this up a little bit more. And the flap is now really nicely coming up everywhere except the front. The anterior area, the myeloid muscle is more low. So I'm going to do a third step. The third step is the most difficult step, and I want to explain that to you. I'm going to put a mirror in here. Put a mirror in here. OK, let's reflect. The third step, I'm going to use the back end of the blade. Many bad hatred. Good job. I keep saying good job to my assistants. That helps them a lot. And here you go. Can you see this? Yes, we can see it. Now with the back end of the blade, with the back end of the blade, I connect the vertical incision to the second zone. This is the third zone. I gently scratch on the periostome and expose the dense connective tissue. And as soon as I am back to this next tooth, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the next zone, then I can just, now I scratch the flap, and I can now expand the flap here too using this instrument. I have to focus on that I'm deep down here. <laughs> I deep down here, so I am not uh, thinning the flap out. There you go, you can let it go. And now you can see that we have the lingual flap really reflected without any bleeding. See that? Yeah. Yes, okay, so can. that was important now. Yes. No, that was a very important okay. step. Yes. Danny, what now do I'm you think clean. about that? That's, uh, 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 we should summarize it. The buckle is a trapezoidal flap, excellent vascularity, so that is very good for the healing potential. And on the lingual, he's mobilizing the flap without any incision. It all done in German would say Stumpe preparation, as a dull preparation. So he's not running the risk to get into a blood vessel and to get into the lingual nerve. Uh, and I know, of course, this is not so easy. Uh, I think the beautiful case here is also that he doesn't have really a big vertical defect, so he doesn't have to mobilize too much vertically. So the, the main goal here is to really increase the width, uh, to do a more horizontal augmentation uh, to allow then the placement of implants later on. In the meantime, I can see that Mario, Mario, can you hear us? Yes. We're switching to Torino, right? We're switching we to, to Torino. Uh, give the guys a cue that we want to switch to Torino because we've moved into a next phase, I think. Eh? Mm -hmm. Mario, can you hear us? Yes. So I have just finished to collect the bone and I'm suturing back the flap. So basically, uh, this is a a flap which could be designed in different ways. Basically, it's the same flap you design when you have to extract an impacted wisdom tooth. Nothing really um, special about it. In this specific case, I was lucky because, well, 
lucky from the surgical point of view because the patient has had lost uh, the second molar, so have more space for collecting the bone. But you can do that in conjunction with the, the wisdom tooth uh, removal or not, so it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a big problem. Uh, with the scrapers, you can really collect a, a great amount of bone, and the advantage is that uh, they adapt uh, much better than the block when you have uh, defects which are not regular. I would say that in the past we've been using a lot of blocks. Nowadays, particularly in the maxilla, we prefer particulate bone because the adaptation is much better and the chances of resorption is much reduced, particularly if you mix it with the DBBMs. So what is the overall aim, Mario, in terms of the volume you would like to get? Do you want to have 50%, do you want to have 80%, do you want to have 100% of touchless bone? What is your aim uh, for these types Th of defects? The percentage is typically 60%, 50-60% of autogenous bone and 40% DBBM, the and protonized from, bovine bone mineral. And from which defects on you do use autogenous bone? Are you also doing pre primary bone augmentation procedure exclusively with uh, artificial synthetic bone or uh, you always add uh, autogenous bone? Let, let me ask the director to put, okay, because I cannot hear him well. The question is whether you always add a touch and bone to any primary bone augmentation or when there is more a smaller volume to regenerate, whether you're also just going to use a, uh, any kind of graft material. Well, of course, when you talk about uh, augmentation, it's, it's like uh, when you talk about a trip. It could be a, a, a two-day trip, a, a two-month trip, a two-year trip. So when you talk about augmentation, it depends. It could be a few millimeters, uh, many more millimeters, or, or even more. So depending on the circumstances, you have to select your, your um, material of uh, graft. The, the, the thing which has to be clear is that if it's vertical augmentation, you need much more autogenous bone than in horizontal augmentation. I think we should clarify here yes. the roles of, the, of these bones two bone fillers. Yeah. Yeah. Autogenous bone, he needs to have an osteogenic potential to speed up the formation of bone, the amount of bone formation in the first two or four weeks or so, and the DBM, as we will discuss later on, is actually to keep the volume when it's regenerated. And I think when you have a small defect, you don't have to go to the ramus to open up a second site, but when you have such a large defect, you need to have an, a second site to get a large volume of autogenous bone. I think what you also have seen, he stores it in a liquid of uh, probably blood and some saline, saline or so. And we know from the research we have done in Bern, actually the autogenous bone releases very quickly growth factors. And these growth factors are actually also helping us yes. uh, to activate the second bone filler when you mix it then. Exactly. I agree 100%. So you're closing up now the... Uh the harvesting site, Don and I think we move yeah, over. The site. We go now back to Budapest in order to see the next steps of the flap elevation and come back to you, to Torino, when you're going to go into your interior site. Now I would like to go to Budapest again. Istvan, can you hear us? There it is. Can you hear us? Yes. E excellent. So We have seen uh, some I've, action. I've, I've uh, the bone. Some action, uh, yeah. And I got a membrane, which is kind of like a mesh and a membrane. It's a combination. It's like a hybrid, which I now have to fixate. And I kind of, I kind of uh, cut the membrane, but I didn't, cut, I didn't overcut the membrane too much. And I would say this is good enough for me. I will cut at the end. And I will use a, and add a mixture of pins and screws. Just another doing. A mixture of pins and screws to fixate. The first thing is going to be a screw. OK, let's retract. Which is the first pin you're gonna you're gonna place? So the first screw. Where is the most critical part it's, to stabilize? It's the, it's the, me the mesiolingual. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be a screw. And that's gonna be a screw. It's gonna be a screw as long as. Yeah. I thought I was cut that. Okay. First, we wanna retract. That's tricky, isn't it? It's tricky. That's difficult. Yeah. yeah. Because you cannot tack it really. Even though. 
Do you remember when we used to not have the self-tapping screws and we used to have to perforate the cortical first mm -hmm. and then insert the that screw? That was even more difficult. That's, that was even worse. Okay, so the first one is in. Worse. First one is in. Excellent. So can you give us a little bit of an idea when do you there use screws and when do you use pins, Istvan? Okay, so this patient, I use 90% of the screws or the pins. But mesiolingual around the canine and more mesially is very easy with the screws. And uh, this patient was so worried that she wanted to have a general anesthesia, so she's sleeping. And she cannot open the mouth. She's, is, this is the most difficult person to do a vertical uh, and any augmentation, the more mandible, because she cannot open the mouth, she cannot pull the tongue. So now I'm forced to use a screw because I can. I cannot ask her to open the pin so I mean the mouth so much. So I want to put in two screws mesially. Yeah. You can use the contra angle handpiece. Yes. Then you don't need the same vertical okay. distance and okay. otherwise attack you have to hammer. Right now. I think it's also I'm important. Do this one. I think it's also important. It's important for the Video audience number. to see also the setup. So I think we should talk about that as well. This is a surgery mm -hmm. that requires six hands yeah. on site. I always have six hands. Very so whenever you don't have actually access to, to put a yeah. pin on, a pin is faster, but uh, when you don't have access to it, then uh, a screw. screw is going to be used. So he said in ideal situation, he's going to use only a screw in the mesiolingual part and then the rest uh, as yeah. many pins as possible. But in this situation where the patient is on the general seizure, cannot open the mouth properly, he prefers to go then for, uh, for screws in the many situations. I think what we also should mention here before that, uh, he opened up the, the bone the cabo and made all these perforations. And I think the pre-surgical evaluation with the cone beam should show if the bone is mainly cortical yes. or has already a component with marrow cavity. Because if it's only cortical all the way down, it's very difficult to get bone formation from that patient. And uh, we see a lot of bleeding, so that seems to be very good. So is when you have placed now two, two, two screws. Two, two screws. Two screws. OK, and I have now, I'm going to place, place the third one. I made, I didn't cut the, the membrane in the lingual, I mean, distally too long, too short. I can cut it at the end. I'm just going to, the third one, I can put on the lingual, or I can put it already here. I'm going to try the lingual, but you can also put it to the, to, the, to, the, to the crest because on the lingual distally, the bone tends to be very soft and it's a thin cortical bone. As, as, as Danny perfectly mentioned, this is a challenge. So this but is more of a challenge. Yeah. Uh, okay. Here, I, okay, let me. Maybe then you can say something about membranes. I think you have used membranes. You, you went through all yeah, the generation yeah. of membranes <laughs> over your last... Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, of course, this is a PTFE yes, so membrane. I, 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 a that means that's a non resorbable yeah. membrane. Yes. Has to be taken out. And I think for these kind of difficult one wall defects, that's the only way to go. Yeah. Uh, uh, the collagen membranes, yeah. luckily, we can use much more often because we have much more often two wall defects, and so it's much easier for us. But uh, that means you need to tack them down and stabilize them. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And we're going to see he's blowing this up uh, very nicely. And then lots of tacks. Yes. That is uh, Istvan Urban technique. The so why does this memory have uh, so many holes? I, was I think you should ask him, you see. Let's, let's ask him, <laughs> let's ask him yeah. later. Can, can I suggest we okay, move to so Torino? Yes. But that looks excellent. He's from, we are moving to Torino. Let's also keep him involved in what we're doing because he's also with his head uh, yes. occupied. So we switch back to Torino and see what's going on there. Is there anything okay, we are you saw, Isabella? Yes, Mario, yeah. given the we're starting with you, can you please describe the incision line and considering that we are in the aesthetic region where those vertical incisions will go and how to perform okay. them to avoid scars? Okay. Um, the main thing here is to make the central incision not right in the center of the crest, but slightly more on the buccal side. Yeah. In this way, we will be able to move a little bit further because remember, we have to, have to create more space. We'll try to stretch the flap, but if we make the incision in the center or 
in the palatal side, it's going to be more difficult. So the, the incision line, it will be slightly more on the buccal side, as I'll show you in a second. That's very the important. Vertical incision very important, because we'll then you want to achieve more height. Yeah. The incision right. must be on the buccal, buccal to lift up the palatal flap. Very important. Correct. And the vertical incision will be on the distal aspect of the lateral incisor. One here, and the other one here. We use a, a 15C blade yeah. because it's slightly smaller than the 15, and they will give us a, a better uh, angulation, and particularly when we go around the lateral incisor, which is a small tooth. Mario, when you perform the vertical incisions, do you bevel the, the, the blade or do you go straight? I go straight. Okay. We will, uh, we will uh, make sure that uh, the suture is properly done. And uh, in this specific case, we know we'll have some scars. Uh, but in this specific case, uh, we cannot avoid them. Uh, Mario, 100%. another question. What's the lip line of that patient? Yes. I didn't hear you. Would you please, please? Is this a high lip line case or a medium or low lip line case? Because I would say a medium. Okay. A medium. Not an extreme. Correct. Okay. Correct. Very good. So maybe then and you can we'll, explain it. And now we will see the periodontally compromised uh, teeth near the, near the defect. In a few seconds, I will show you. Danny, tell me about while, whilst Mario is working, he has an. Uh, position the vertical incisions one tooth away from the site. Would you agree with this? Would you go further away? What are the pros and cons about where you put the vertical incisions? I think this is one of the questions that has to be addressed. If I would do this case, K9, K9. Why? To have a large base of the flap mm -hmm. and to have the scar lines more outside the aesthetic frame. But this is, of course, personal preference. And regarding the, uh, the crest incision, would you have placed it the same position as Mario has did Ma it? Or how would you approach this Mine from a crest? Mine would have been two millimeters less to the buckle. Less, less to the buckle. Less to the buckle. Yes. It's a little bit much. But we'll see. I don't know. Are we planning to place implants today or we just do a staged approach? Just a staged stage. approach. Okay, Two-stage appro two approach. Okay. That's good. Then we fully agree on that one. Mario, the tissue looks quite scarred. Yeah, because, uh, of course, uh, uh, we have had uh, lots of period preparation. And before reaching this point, we have seen him uh, many, many times in order to improve his plaque control and uh, the quality of the tissue. And, uh, you know, after so many months, uh, we can say we are successful. So, Mario, but we can see you work hard. Uh, we let you work hard here a little bit more to uh, open up the flap, and we're uh, going to switch now to Budapest. Thank you, Mario. And uh, we'd like now to go back to Budapest to Istvan, because we see that he has already done uh, some progress. Istvan, can you hear us again? Progress. Istvan, can you hear us again? Yes, I can hear you. Can I ask? Yes. So, what I did was... Yes. <laughs> no, so, I... You know, we, we harvested the bone before we started now, so we don't waste a lot of time with that. But that's actually really fast, because we put it to the bone mill. We don't have to take a very, like, um, beautiful block or anything. We just take a little uh, trephine that is digitally planned, and di different lengths and diameters, and then we put it to the bone mill. And I mixed it with uh, exenogenic bone graft, which is anorganic bovine bone mineral. As about 60% of the autogenous bone, as you can see, it's already stabilizing because of the uh, you know, the perforations, there's some blood coming in there. And I'm just, you know, I did not really do any, you know, measuring of the membrane. I just did one cut, and we're going to do the rest at the very end. So now I'm going to overlap this. Isvan, when you are folding. And I want to do. Isvan, can you hear me? Yeah. Isvan. Yes. When, yeah, you're yeah, yeah. when you're folding the membrane, do you first bend it so that yeah. it has a box shape? Because I'm seeing that you are just folding it. And aren't you worried that you're going to yeah. decrease the horizontal dimension? 
So basically, I used to bend it, but not anymore, because there's just so much bone grab that it's going to fill it in like a big belly. That is a lot of food in there. And see, that was a pin. Good. And so, as you can see, and quick. it's still like a centimeter oh, of bone at the end. Uh, we're going to yes. see that. Oh, I'm going to pressurize this. I'm going to put another one. And this is a, a membrane here and a mesh here. And we can talk about that, obviously. And this is just to, to get a better adaptation. Maybe and you I'm can tell take us. I'm going to this one now, and I'm going to. Yeah. Ronnie, if I may, yeah. if we can handle even more playing parts, we also have audience questions coming in. We just moved past it, but Isfa, maybe you can still answer. Question is, where go. did you harvest this large amount of autologous bone? You already told us you did yeah, it before. So basically, I would, I would harvest it here, but I, I did to the other, other ramus around the wisdom tooth, and that's what I did uh, an incision, and I harvested the bone. And, and remember, it, I didn't harvest a lot, but once you put it to the bone mill, the, the volume gains a lot. So that's why you, uh, you're much better off with that. Now, this is my signature fold, okay, that I, I'm doing now. It's, if you're worried about that, this is not going to do any, any harm because it's like so deep, but I like to do this because it's stepping the food down. And I'm going gonna, gonna to fill in some more bone graft, like in a sausage, and I'm going to fixate this, and I'm, gonna use in, I'm using pins now. This is the hardest part of the cortical bone. This is, I call it, I nickname it, the porcelain. Porcelain. And this type of <laughs> pin, this type of master pin goes into the porcelain like perfectly. And I'm going to now fill in. And this is not a real sausage. That I could use here a collagen membrane and do a sausage. But this is like, a little bit like a sausage. See, I'm just going to fill it in, densely pack it. And I'm just going to add a little bit of more bone here. East one, so you might to touch more bone. East one, you might comment a little bit on the yes. uh, on the membrane per se. We just touched before with Danny uh, uh, using here a membrane which has quite of large perforations. Can you give us a little bit more of the uh, of how you make a decision to take a membrane like this, and what is the yeah. biologic rationale behind that? Okay, so we submitted already, and we did two preclinical, large uh, preclinical studies. We submitted one of them. And it shows that this has a much better vascularization through the periostum, through the hose. And actually, it also shows more uh, bone uh, kind of like uh, maturation, yeah, mineralization. So here, I have a little bit of a complication with one of the pins, but so that's why I'm using it. There's significantly more vascularization of the bone. And clinically, we also published one article. So clinically also gives you a much more solid bone. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take this one out. But in. Danny, let's, let's talk about if it's perforated, yes, it allows vascularization, but what about in case of an exposure of the bacteria penetration? So where do we stand? Because yeah, this that's a great question. That's a great question. Yeah. I would say okay. the following. So if, if this membrane gets exposed, of course, then we are in the old days of cortex. And we Let's know then uh, you better uh, hurry up to take it off, I guess, because there we had four weeks and then you had an infection. So I think you need a very skillful surgery. Now, I think a posterior mandible is not so uh, susceptible as other locations in the maxilla. Uh, I also know that certain uh, uh, colleagues are actually using this membrane. On, on top, they place a collagen membrane to eliminate that potential risk. I don't know. Yeah. I think the perforation is an interesting concept because the ingrowth of blood vessels is extremely important for the final outcome of bone augmentation because only the augmented bone that has at the end a vascularity will survive. Huh? And that means when you have more, uh, let's say more mineralization means that there was already a bone remodeling phase in that area and he waits here normally six, eight or even longer months uh, to really help the bone to mature. And yeah. I think that's for me a super interesting question because I think uh, yeah. we have learned uh, the yeah. last 20 years that the most uh, important part is excluding then the, uh, uh, the, the, the soft tissue cells of the yeah. fibroblasts in order to give the bone the time in order to grow in. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So we have treated a large number of animals 
with a non-perforated membrane, with a perforated membrane, big vertical defects, and a perforated membrane covered with a collagen membrane. These were the three groups. And the best was, was the, in terms of vascularization and bone maturation by far, I mean, super significantly better, statistically, was this membrane. Yeah. Now, then we started to use this clinically, and we see this so much better than the other one. Uh, so, but in the study, we used like a longer resorbable membrane, which was not very, um, you know, not very good. So we use, we, we use a collagen membrane on top of this most of the times, but we use a very fast absorbing one, because that would, if you use like a crossing membrane on the top of this, then you would kill the idea. See, this is the idea is that through this hose, there will be blood vessels going through, and that's what we proved, and hopefully it's going to be published uh, soon, in, in these um, series of animals. I want to have another, another comment. See, I'm touching the tooth, and you should not touch the tooth. I did not yes. really plan this perfectly digitally. But the good thing with the membrane, and that the soft tissue is a little bit, I, think, I would say it's more challenging maybe to place. I had to fix it on the lingual, but it's soft. Yeah. So the soft tissue, especially the lingual tissue, which is thin, likes it much more, so I think that there, there is going to be a much less chance to get an exposure with it. Plus, I can cut it out with my, with my blade now, and only occasionally I'm touching with the titanium, which I'm going to have to cut with some scissors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I have now here is, um, is a very stable bone graft, very stable bone graft, and I'm just going to cut the membrane now, and basically, uh, I need a millimeter and a half, at least, of a distance between the membrane and the tooth. The tooth has to be very, very clean. Look at this tooth. This has a, a temporary crown that is like that perfectly sealing the... Um, there's no gaps between the crown and the tooth, so there's no bacteria. And also, this has to be really, really well cleaned off. Okay, so I'm just going to make a cut. And um, another message. This is not a beauty contest. So here, if my cut is not going to be the most beautiful cut on the planet, I'm not going to be suicidal about that. <laughs> That's very important, like in yes. the old days, eh? okay. because yes. we did not know that in the beginning of cortex and had a lot of infections through the sulcus of an adjacent tooth. But when we go back to the membrane yeah. question, I think yes. we have to differentiate. This is a very demanding one wall defect, and he expects the growth of bone five, six, seven millimeters horizontally, a little bit vertically, and therefore probably to get the whole formation of bone from the back bone surface is too much. So to get also some support from blood vessels from the periosteum, I think it's a very interesting concept, yeah. But coming back to that question, yes. first we okay. said we want to exclude yes. the cells. Yeah. And yeah. now we, have, we see membranes more and more which actually are not uh, that cell occlusive, but they provide a good stability. Yeah. And this comes to the point, I think, that we see a shift in uh, bone regeneration away from the primary aim to exclude the cells to more the primary aim to really have a very stable, uh, stabilized uh, regenerative material. No, but I would not say primary goal. Okay. You have two pr goals. Uh, one is to have a membrane to exclude the soft tissue cells, and the other one, you need stability in the augmentation area. And when you have a two-wall defect, a three-wall defect, this is easy to do with the, with the defect morphology. But in a one-wall defect, you cannot achieve that so easy. There you need fixation devices or a stiff membrane, non resorbable membrane, or the other one, this mesh, what we're going to discuss later on. Istvan, do you have to add something? Okay, what is for you more important, the exclusion of the cells or the stability of the membrane? Yeah, so it looks like it's both. It's, it's the, me the membrane should be today as a stabilizing tool that is biocompatible and allowing the cells to communicate with the, with the overlying soft tissues, the soft tissue cells. And that's what uh, very clearly in these uh, preclinical studies, we, I think, were able to prove. It's not published yet. So first, the first study, we looked at the mesenchymal cells in the periosteome, excluding them or not, we found extremely significant differences. Second study, we looked at vascularization and the maturation of the bone, and again, uh, significant differences. And a very interesting side 
um, thing that we found that whenever you put perfectly the side of the membrane corners here, even if you have the holes, there's not a lot of soft tissue ingrowth because the soft tissue, cell, the soft tissue fibers are pretty long, but they want to turn in. So this is my area where there will be some pseudoperiosteum formation. And this is why I want to use here, I'm going to densely compact some more bone. I'm going to adapt this more, and then I'm going to use here a collagen membrane just to secure this. The bone graft is going to be stable enough. You know, as, as we, I will show you also occlusally where we are now, and you see that we're kind of like, I want to have like a centimeter of bone. So as you can see, it was not pre-bent, but it's really wide yes. right now, and this is what we want to get. Yes. You can see it very nicely, yeah. Istvan, thank and, you very and much. Again, this is you're welcome. So we are moving okay, away. I, I could adapt here. So we are moving away. Okay, let's give me some more bone. Touch Should we switch uh, to Torino yes. also yes. to uh, look at what Mario is doing? And I also have a question from the audience for Mario, Mario which came in right when we were talking about the incision. So it's a little while back. We've seen that he's uh, moved on. Question is about why doing the incision buccally. You were also talking about that. Um, Emil is writing, wouldn't it be possible to get more keratinized tissue to the front when cutting slightly palatal? Yes, but in this specific case, the, uh, the main, main, uh, prop, the main risk is uh, exposure of the graft or exposure of the mesh. So we'll deal with keratinized mucosa later on. In, the, in this specific case, we want to reduce the risk of exposure of the graft or the mesh, so that is the safest incision to do. Clear, thank you, and thank you, Emil, for submitting that. It's, it's, it's that. like, you know, you, you, Mario, you, you, first, you... Sorry. you first think about the implant, and then you think about the color of the tooth. Mario, can you show us the incisal canal? Because I can see that you, the palatal flap, you have elevated the palatal flap, but there is the bundle attached. Could you please tell us how you deal with this? Yeah, it's right here. Do you have to adapt the, the, your mesh so that you do not, you lateralize yeah. it? Yeah, the mesh, mesh will be adapted around it. We'll see in a few seconds. Now, one thing you have to understand is that, particularly in a parental compromised patient, there is a lot of tissue which is not bone, and you have to make sure that you clean carefully. So it's time consuming, uh, but uh, it's very important because if you create a space underneath the mesh, but there is uh, granulation tissue, you will not have bone regeneration. You have regeneration of granulation tissue. So you see here, I've been working for five minutes, 10 minutes now, but still I have to clean. And th that's because, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, the patient had the periodontal disease in the area, so lots of uh, granulation tissue is present still here. Also, we have to make sure that we clean carefully the surface, the root surface of the adjacent teeth. Our plan is to rebuild a portion of the periodontal ligament which is, was destroyed, and for doing that, we'll promote the regeneration through amelogenin. In a few seconds, you will see that I will place the adapter. I'll try to see if the mesh is well adapted to the, to the site. Danny, in your experience, uh, when we have these compromised teeth, this is uh, probably the most challenging because you are obviously rebuilding. There is a potential that we, Mother Nature gives us, which is the height of the adjacent peaks. Yeah. Now, he has just mentioned that he would like to promote new clinical attachment level through the use of, of the amelogenin. Now, in your experience, do you do this on a regular basis in the aesthetic cases to be able to bring down this, the, all the tissues and create a further attachment or not? What is the evidence Isabella. that we have? Isabella. Yes. Isabella, you have to be a periodontist. I know, but I I'm know. challenging Danny. I want to ask him. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, Danny. I'm only an honorary periodontist. Uh, he's an honorary <laughs> periodontist. <laughs> now, I would say the following. If you have a, a vertical deficiency in the mid, as in the mid maxilla, aesthetic zone, that's why I asked the question, is it a low lip line, a high lip line case? If it's a low lip line case, and we could do a horizontal augmentation alone, do an implant placement later on or simultaneously and use then pink ceramics to actually 
restore the case with a beautiful aesthetics and it's then covered by the lip, that would always be my preference because then the search is much, much easier. Because uh, uh, I learned once from Dennis Tarnow uh, one miracle at once. Huh? And I'm not sure if you can really uh, re-get this periodontal ligament to grow back and at the same time to grow the bone back. And at the end, because you do a second surgery, you elevate the flap again, which is a second trauma, that that ends up then in a case that looks like when she was 20 years old. I think that's a little bit unrealistic. What do you say about that, Mario, when you listen to a famous oral surgeon, which is an honorary periodontist? Uh, no, what does I a mean, true periodontist I mean, say to that? No, seriously, you cannot think that in a case like this, you can grow the bone on the tooth up to this level, but maybe to this level, yes. Yeah. So you have to be, you have to be um, careful, but also you have to have realistic expectation. Yeah. Also, in a case like this, I will try to restore the vertical dimension to a large extent. And as I mentioned before, I don't plan to place the implant. So if something is not perfect, I still have a second chance to improve it. That's a very good point. Huh? Yes. That when you do the staged approach, you have the disadvantage yes. to have twice an open flap procedure, applying some trauma. But, but the big advantage, you wait how much you get, and then you place the implants then you know what you have gotten. Yes. And you could even do a second time a little re-augmentation. Yeah. So these are just what you have to weigh in, pros and cons. And I think I would always do a case like this staged. Yes, of course. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, too, too demanding. And of course, if we don't and, get, and, and I'm sure and we and don't get, if patient is very demanding, yeah. then of course you give them the two laterals uh, and a prosthetic solution, so yes. it will look good. And one thing uh, Danny and I completely agree is that we don't feel immediacy is a value. Long-term <laughs> maintenance is a value. Perfect yeah. results is a value. But immediacy is just like cost, like anything else, is our variables. But uh, in a case like this, you have to take your time. You have to give nature the possibility yes. to restore what was destroyed. If you think about the, the lateral incise here, the attachment loss is 10 millimeters. So this tooth is not really that's strong, but it's not a good idea to remove it just because uh, it's, 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 it's in this situation. We try to rebuild, we try to restore, we try to create a new attachment. Amori, I think we, we are leaving you a little bit to clean all the... Uh, 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 Ronnie? Wanna... Yes? Just let me show you the adaptation of the yes. mesh. Okay, good. Yes. Hurry so up. Good. And then I'll let you, and I'll let you go. <laughs> See that? how nicely it's adapted. I've been using mesh, titanium meshes for many years, and typically we had to cut and mold and change, and in this way we save like 15, 20 minutes, and it's uh, much more predictable. See how nicely it's adapted? Yeah. And now you can also see the adaptation in the puddle side. You see the nerve is here, and the mesh was uh, prepared in such a way that to give space to, for it. And Mario, do you load the mesh prior to positioning it, right? Correct. Okay. We'll mix the bone. We Otherwise have lots it of would bone. Be impossible. More than we need, actually, because uh, you were kind of late, so I kept scrapping the bone. So we have lots of bone. Excellent. So thank you for showing this. Can and I, we're going to move quickly, quickly to Budapest. One question to Torino, still, uh, since we're still there, because people are watching, and otherwise it's way past what we've seen. Quick question, what we just saw you do, Mario. Why not use a burr on a handpiece to clean the fibrous tissue to be faster, was the question. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a uh, periodontist. Well, again, uh, <laughs> you, you can use the burr, but sometimes you, you take too much. So be careful. You can use anything you want. Uh, hand instruments are also useful. The, the main thing is to do it properly. Exactly. I do the same. <laughs> As a periodontist, I, I, I completely agree with Mario. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's switch uh, back to Budapest because there's also a time-pressured question for uh, Dr. Urban as well. I hope you remember, uh, Isfan, if you hear us. Um, about, I need to calculate, the question yes. came in at 08, it's now 013. So five minutes ago, someone saw you inject something in the vestibular. What was that, was the question? I, I'm, I'm ready to do the... the, the um, 
the buccal flap advancement. And before we do that, we give some anesthetic to the patient so we don't have bleeding. So, I mean, okay. so you can see better. Plus, yeah. when she wakes up, she's not going to be in pain. This was just anesthetic. Thank you. And I'm more than ready to do the flap advancement on the buckle if you guys are ready for me. Yes, we are yes. totally ready for you. Yes, and Isvan, can, okay. you please, can you please Perfecto. show us, Isvan, show us step by step, giving us all the information on the release. Yes, I will. Please. Exactly. That's why I was waiting. So first, <laughs> the, the periosteum is about 0 0.4 millimeters. And I'm going to go and only cut the periosteum. And I don't cut any deeper than that. See that very carefully with a new 15C nice. blade. And I'm going closer now to the nerve. Nerve is more anterior, so I'm staying more apical still. And I'm still staying a little bit more apical down here, but I'm coming up because here's the nerve. Let's wash it out because it's a little bit bloody. I think we can beautifully okay, see this. Point. Is, uh, excellent. I, I, <sighs> It's a wonderful, wonderful way to see it. Oh. Okay, um, here we go. And here's the nerve. And now I'm going to go up here. And I'm just above the nerve. I curve my incision on top of the nerve, but I'm 0 0.4 millimeters only into the tissue. Go more anterior, then I'm going to curve it back down to here. There we go. Now, as you can see, the nerve is right there. Okay, now I'm going to take another blade. The next blade is a more, is a 15 blade, which has a more, I'm going to use it like a, on the sideways, like sideways, and I'm going to, I'm going to look if there is any, any little bundles that are still holding the flap together, like here. And sideways, I, I like to say that I'm just going to go either a 45 degree or a 90 degrees. I'm going to go and just kind of like play the guitar on these fibers until they rupture. Here's one. And here's another one. Here you go. There we go. Here. Sideways. So this is very safe to do sideways. We call it debundling. There we go. I'm just around the nerve. I like 90 degrees around the nerve. There we go. Here, there's another 90 degrees. See that? And it's just opening up. I'm not going deeper. I just got rid of some of those little bundles that were holding it. Now I will do a test stretch. And I'm right on the nerve, and I started the nerve. I don't want to put more force. I just gently pull the tissue aside now. See that? <coughs> Not six. So thank you. It's, it's important up. to see how superficial you actually are. So Correct. It's, not like, uh, doing it's a never deep. It's yes. not deep. I think important is that you see he's always pulling the flap. Yes and cuts very superficially, and then you feel with the left hand immediately when it's yes. releasing. It's released. Yes, I think so that's this so is very important. important. It's parallel. So you pull and cut. And when it's releasing, then you know you can go ahead. And also important is the inclination I'm going to of stretch his more. I'm going to stretch more now, more in the front. And here you can see one of the nerve bundles running in the front. You can see the main nerve here. Mm -hmm. And my test stretch was I was not happy here in the back. OK, okay so here I need more, a little bit more debundling. So again, I'm going to take the 15 blade back and very gently, very gently, I'm going to reinforce this here just like that, like this. Okay. And then I'm going to be able to, to stretch this more. But again, I'm very, very superficial. And I have to say, I wish I learned this 20 years ago, because there was a lot of sweat <laughs> yes. before here. It is one of the most crucial steps of the yes. entire surgery. Uh, I think it's the difference between a success oh. Let me see. and a, yes. a complete closure versus a, yes. an opening. Both from and the navel and the buckle. A patient can almost, 
almost swallow the flap. I call yes. it. I call this the swallowing test. Can you swallow the flap? Then it's good. Okay. <laughs> there we go. So you can see this again. So, now, uh, so, okay, I could do more, but I don't have to. Isvan, why, why yes. are you doing it at the very end of the surgery? Because Marius do, has just done it prior to the augmentation. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Well, <laughs> number one, as you can see, it doesn't really bleed. It's so delicate. Number two, let's turn to the left. Number two, if you would do it, especially in the mandible or anywhere, anywhere, even the anterior maxilla where is the, the inf, in, infraorbital nerve, Imagine your assistants are pulling on the flap, they're, they're, they're trying, and it's very vulnerable to damage the nerve now. Yeah. See that? So the last thing you want to do is to do this at the very beginning. It's very important. Especially here. I mean, like, you know, I, don't, I didn't see Mario's case. That's a different case. But in this case, you don't want to do it because you make the nerve more vulnerable for damage during the push, the yeah. pull, and the retraction. Okay. How would you do yeah, it in why. the anterior upper jaw, East one? I do the same way. I do the same way. I also do like very, very careful at the very end. Mm -hmm. And I try to be, you know, there's not much same. of a, a, a bleeding. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a good control. If I don't do it at the beginning, I can see better. I can fixate better. My sister is not going to maybe accidentally over pull. The infraorbital nerve damage is one of the key complication for anterior maxillary vertical augmentation. You know, like a smaller augmentation doesn't really matter. But a big vertical augmentation, you have to be so careful because you go and with advance the flap and the infraorbital nerve or the mental nerve can be damaged. So that's why you want to do like exactly like this around the inf infraorbital nerve, the way we do it here. So that's the way we do it, at least. We should move. Yes. Another thing I want to mention, here I densely filled since then the bone graft. And I could use a screw here or a pin, and that screw potentially could be too close to the root. I just leave it like this, and I use here instead a collagen membrane yeah. to seal this area. Yeah. OK, so see that at the collagen? This is stable enough. The collagen membrane is good enough. In my experience, you don't need more fixation. I could have done the same thing. I could have used a collagen membrane and do this surgery. But that is. Um, I think with this one was like pretty much perfect uh, in terms of selection of the membrane. And um, I wanted to make it a little bit more challenging. And it's still not finished. <laughs> OK, <laughs> but I'm going to be ready to, to suture, to put the collagen membrane ready to suture. So I'm going to maybe wait, or you want me to suture? What do you want me to do? No, let's, let's wait for the moment. You can start I, I doing your collagen membrane, and okay. then uh, let us wait until you start suturing, because yes. that's Im important okay. to see. But we would like okay. to switch now to Torino. And I uh, can see that Mario did uh, a lot of progress. Mario, can you hear us again? Yes. Excellent. I've just Maybe you can uh, give applied us amelogenine on the root, as yeah. I mentioned before, to promote regeneration of the periodontal ligament. We don't see the periodontal ligament, but we know there is such a thing. So the only, thing to pro the only way to promote regeneration Biologically, is uh, through the application of the amelogenine. Now I have filled the mesh with the bone, actually with the mixture between bone, autogenous bone, and DBBM. And now you see that uh, I can adapt it. We had a small incident here. The, we typically use uh, self-tapping screws, but they were contaminated in the preparation, so I will have to use... Uh, screws which are not the one I like best. Apologize for that, but that's something happened when you do live things. That's reality, Mario. Yeah, right. So I'm using... Uh, I'm using... Uh, Maybe Mario, you can tell us a little bit before, now you placed the, uh, the, the three-dimensional scaffold. You have released the, periostal, uh, the periosteum, before now, you're going to place the, um, the mesh. And we have seen from yes. this one, he does it at the very end. What is your rationale behind that? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know if there is a scientific rationale. This is not the right moment. Too many because, things uh, the sometimes time. <laughs> uh, sometimes uh, you don't have much bleeding. 
We let you work now. Just do the pins or the, the screws, and then we come back to that question. Let me ask. Uh, oh, okay. So, see, the, the, these screws are okay, but uh, there are now more uh, modern skew, screws which have a flat head, and they are self-tapping, and uh, they are better. But uh, as I mentioned before, this is a, a backup. Anyhow, the good thing is that two screws are typically sufficient to stabilize yeah, yeah. a custom-made uh, a custom-made uh, um, mesh. While if you have uh, a homemade uh, uh, mesh, it takes uh, four or five different screws. Also, compared to the beautiful technique called sausage technique by my friend uh, Isvan, it's much quicker. You see. It's very stable. Two screws, few seconds. Look how stable it is. Danny, have, do you use, you've, you've probably used many titanium meshes in your life or never? We, we, we used meshes in the 1990s, I tell you frankly. That didn't work well and then we stopped. Okay. Uh, when I look at it, uh, I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, of course, this is now with a 3D technique, as a digital technique that you can actually have it. So it fits perfectly. So I think for very demanding cases, yes. uh, that could be an, at least a consideration. So I now don't there want is to a, be completely there is a, Okay. Now there is an open question. Shall we place a membrane or not? And there is no really evidence in one way or the other one. So in this specific case, I will use a, a, an additional membrane just to be on the safe side, belt and suspenders. But as I mentioned before, there is no um, scientific evidence that this is going to be really necessary. Yeah, yeah. Mario, what, what do you do when you see them intraoperatively, that according to your plan, you need to modify your mesh? How are you going to do it and, uh, and with what you do it? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Please when repeat. You, when you see during the operation that your three-dimensional planning was not uh, uh, ideal and you need to adapt the, uh, the mesh, how you do that? You know what? It never happened. Okay, that's the best way. <laughs> seriously. seriously. <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, and I would, you know, I would, you know I'm, I'm, I'm honest. So it, it, it's, it's always perfect. The, of course, you have to, to, to send a, a good CT, but if you do that, Never had the problem with the, the shape of the mesh. One important thing also is that when you receive the first PDF, you have to, check, you have to caref carefully check the design because you have to approve it. And, uh, or you can propose a modification. And that's uh, an important step in the process. You cannot just send it a lousy CT, do not pay attention to the details, and then pretend it works. And what about placing a pin or a screw on the, on the palatal side? No need. Say it again, please. What about? What about placing a screw also on the palatal side? Well, there is no need. I mean, look, I mean, you can place as many as you want, but, you know, <laughs> what can you accept? Well, look. That's yeah, impressive. Mario, what about the retrieval? Do you have difficulties in retrieving after a few months? The, well, the mesh? Th this new design, oh, that gives me the opportunity to, to, to specify a little bit about the new design. Now, if you look at, uh, I don't know if the, the if you can, okay. Now, you see the design is slightly different from the, this area from this area. Now here, the mesh is uh, different, and this will facilitate the removal of design. Also, if you look carefully, here there are predetermined breaking points. So, of course, you have to be patient, but it's not really an issue. Last but not least, if, if one of the edges is embedded into bone, don't get crazy to eliminate. I mean, it's just a piece of titanium, and it doesn't hurt. That means you leave it in place. Yeah. Can I ask an audience of the, or a question of the audience to you, Mario? The question here is, why not perforate the bone before placing the titanium mesh? I perforate the bone. He yes, did. Ah, I did. Okay, so uh, we oh, maybe did. Oh, to to open up the open the spaces, the mirror spaces, and to pro, to promote regeneration. Again, there is no really that much evidence. It's necessary, but it doesn't hurt, and most people do it. 
I think we move on now. Thank you, Mario. Be, and uh, we can see you place now the membrane. Before your suture, please wait. We're going to switch now to Budapest because uh, East One is also waiting to start the suturing process. And we move to Budapest. East One, can you hear us again? Yeah. Hear us again? Yes, yes, yes. I want to show you something. I, I used here the collagen membrane. I'm going to suture, but I had a little bit of that that you couldn't see. Can you? Fog man. Uh, I moved this membrane, and on the lingual, in here, the membrane is, was a little bit more sticking out. Yes. And I put an additional screw in here. I put an additional screw in here until we were waiting to make sure it's held down so it's not going to puncture through the, the flap. Yeah. I think some of you may have seen it when I was doing it. Now it's difficult to show with the mirror. But there is another, another screw that I did, OK? Then now it's perfectly adapted. I think pre not perfectly, but well adapted, but good enough. OK, I'm ready to suture. The first suture goes in the middle of the ridge. And the reason is that you want to coronally, but also laterally position the flap. I mean, coronally, that you want to close. I mean, you check. You check, and it looks like there's more than enough. So you, I go in the middle of the ridge. I go about five millimeters away from the incision. I go to the lingual. I tend to use a PTFE suture because it's really clean and, and very predictable suture. And I put in three horizontal mattress sutures. Yeah. The first one goes in the middle. The That's a five very millimeter important. rule. It goes five millimeters away from each other. And I go one, two, three forward. And I'm going to use a sailing suture. I go two, for, two forward, that's a slit suture, and then one backward. Retract, please. Mm -hmm. And I cut this long because this is difficult to remove. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm already removing them maybe at three weeks when they tend to be much easier to remove than two weeks. Rest of the sutures you can remove at two weeks. OK, now I'm going to readapt this one. OK, it's very important. This Collagen membrane is a very, uh, na it's a native collagen membrane. It will resorb within the next six weeks. And it has been proven that it can transvascularize. So blood vessels can go through. Because if you use a collagen membrane that will not allow the blood vessels to go through, then we kill the purpose of the hose. And Yves van Ricardo is asking, anything, why are you using the collagen membrane in the first place? What clinical difference will it make? OK, yes, because, because of this. See, this one is not well adapted mesially, and I want to seal that off. As you can see, this collagen membrane, I only, I only used in the mesial. The distal part of the membrane was not covered. OK, so that's the difference. Here, it was not well adapted, and I just compensate with the misadaptation. Isvan, in the aesthetic region, would is you, this? can you hear me? You would use PTFE yes, sutures yes, yes. for the mattress, and would you still use PTFE for the single interrupted second line of suture, or would you change material? Depends. Depends. I, 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 for the vertical incision, for sure, I use 6 and 7 O's, which I'm going to do today. For the interrupted, it depends on the, on the, on the, on the patient. It depends on the defect, the, the delicacy. But okay. delicacy. But there is a thinner PTFE suture that I'm sometimes using. And I also use 6-0 nylon sutures for the interrupted. Okay. But I never did one case in my life without the PTFEs for the um, mattress sutures. So I don't know. I'm probably you can use other things too. But you know, it's just like, this is how I trained. And this is how I do it. Now, as you can see. These three sutures are holding the entire thing together. Yes. OK. Istvan, we, we learned okay, that so we have now that these three horizontal matrices are of utmost importance. Maybe you can wait a few minutes. We're going to yeah. go to uh, Mario. I think uh, to explain that, when you do horizontal matrix sutures from both sides, then you get a better contact from periosteum to periosteum, like a flap inversion. And then you have a much better chance for primary closure. Yeah. If you go end to end, it's much more difficult. So and you, you need to do that. Eh? And I think it's very well performed. Also, the execution. Uh, it's is okay. Superb. I'm just going to close the, the distal because that's boring. Okay, good. So we're going to switch to Torino. And I uh, would like to ask Mario whether he can hear us. 
Yes, I can. I could see that you already advanced. Can you give us a little bit well, of feedback of your sutures? Because I think that's very crucial that we learn all the details and all your thoughts about that. Yes. So I started with the horizontal, deep mattress suture in the middle so that I could really uh, uh, um, close the flap. You see there is no tension. This the suture, the one that was given at first, is the one that holds uh, probably 70% of the of this strength. And then I decided to move uh, to the letter incisor here, and then I will go the other one so to make sure that it, it's not stretched on one side or the other one. And these are vertical mattress suture. Mario, what are you using for the vertical, for the horizontal mattress? It, what is it? It's a Vicryl mm -hmm. 3 0. The, the tissue, the soft tissue is very thick, very hard. So I decided to use a 3 0. And then I, I'm using now a 4 0. So for East One, it was very important to use an EPDFE suture. Do you also using EPDFE sutures? No, I, use, I prefer Vicryl. Vicryl. Is there uh, a rationale? They, resort, they, they have. Uh, they have uh, they, they are very strong. They resorb. If by chain something is, is left, it's not a problem. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think there is uh, really evidence one way or the other one. I think it's uh, the preference of uh, each single operator. Yes, now you're doing the, the other vertical releasing. Give us a little bit some, uh, some ideas. Huh? What are your ideas here? So you go through the buckle flap, and then you go on the knees, the Contact. The contact point to the palatal and go back then Correct. there. Correct. It's this is very important because the, the, the thing you want to avoid is uh, stretching on one side or the other one. Because uh, the area around a tooth is one of the Wait. most critical area. If you have an exposure, typically it's uh, around a tooth. So it's important that you have a tension-free suture and then it's uh, very well balanced between right and left. Where exactly go, uh, is your vertical incision? I cannot really properly see. Can you show this as a periodontal probe where you really okay. made your vertical releasing I, I, incision? I, I, will, I will move the patient in a second so you can see. Let's see if we can do it. In the meantime, maybe I can throw in a practical question. Someone spotted a paste that you put on the teeth, and the question is, what was it, Mario? I didn't hear you. Say it again, please. The question from the audience was, what is the paste that you just put on the teeth? We know it. It's the MRI. Yeah, feel free to answer. I mean, uh, <laughs> there's people in the room who would love to know. So Isabella, tell me, what was it? It's the amelogenin yeah. or amelogenin. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, OK, I'm sorry. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't hear you well. OK, the, the, oh, the, the, the amelogenin are Melogenin. proteins that promote regeneration of the periodontal ligament. I'm sorry, I didn't, I, the, the communication was not clear. Yeah, I, told, I said about this. It's the only biological component that promotes regeneration. So you have, you have to understand that if you place bone in direct contact of a tooth, you can have ankylosis and or resorption. So it's important every time you do a graft, a bone graft, you promote regeneration. And the only way to do it, as I mentioned, is um, with a melogenin. Now, before, see, this is the first uh, suture I, I, I made. Now we are going for two more horizontal suture right here, one on the right and one on the, right, on the left. They are slightly more coronal than the first one, but still they will give me space for interrupted suture to close everything afterwards. Can you show us more, again, the detail regarding the vertical incision there? Because it's hard to see where you really perfectly reflect okay. the flap there. OK. Let me do this, and then I'll, sh I'll move the patient. Okay. But what we can really see, Danny, is kind of, uh, he also kind of released the flap uh, really nicely, so it, there is not, uh, there's yeah. no tension uh, there on top of that. Oh, that's, yeah, absolutely. that's, of course, very, very important. No matter what you do, no matter what uh, technique you use, no yes. matter what type of suture you use, releasing the flap is uh, one of the most important 
steps in uh, carbon regeneration. I must say it's very nice, gentlemen, to see that both surgeons have followed a very, very similar protocol when it yeah. comes to the incision, the verticals, the steps. Because we all know this is a surgery that does not allow any shortcuts. You have to do your every single step with precision. And it's nice to see the parallelism between yeah. two. Two separate sites, two countries, two different surgeons with minor differences. But at the end of the day... And three moderators. And three moderators. <laughs> <laughs> well, to the moderators also, who are also... Uh, three harsh moderators. <laughs> <laughs> Isabella, Ronnie, Danny, maybe yeah. you can answer this question from the audience. How deep should the horizontal mattress be? Any advice? Is there, is there something generic to say? It's a five millimeter rule. Uh, Isfan just, just gave us this, uh, this important yeah. information. Yeah. Five millimeters from the, the gingival margin and five millimeters apart from catch to catch. Perfect. So maybe we, one Mario, we let you work a little bit, and we're going to switch one more time to, uh, to Budapest, because it seems to be they're going to be bored. So uh, let's uh, entertain them uh, a little bit. Gets Ronnie, Ronnie, <laughs> he, he's asking Ronnie? for coffee. Look. Yes. Istvan, he's can you hear Ronnie? us? He's already thinking of the operative. Ronnie? OK. Istvan, can you hear us again? Yes. Uh -huh. Excellent. So thank you for waiting. Yes. So the next suture, we have now the three major sutures with the five millimeter rule as explained by Isabella so properly. And, uh, and now what is the next suture? The next suture is either the papilla or this. I prefer this because this is more important. If I do this, it's going to be more difficult to close the vertical incision. The vertical incision is open now because you put a lot of tissue here. But we're going to have a, the way to close that. I think it's important Ten also minutes. to see that. But the most important thing, that you're going to have the bone. And that's why you want to close here, because this is the area which is just behind the tooth and it has to be perfectly closed and sealed. And you either do a vertical mattress here or this single interrupted, but I think it's, it's standing up so nicely that this single interrupted will take care of it. OK, so I've done that. And then I'm going to go and... Um, Put a couple of sutures on the crest, and then I go to the mesial, the papilla, and the, there is, remember, there's a vertical incision on the lingua, which we need to close. The purpose of that vertical incision was to see, remember when we were doing the mirror and I was scratching with the back end of my blade? That's the purpose of the vertical incision, is to see and control yourself while you're doing that. He's talking about the vertical and the mesial. OK, so I'm just going to do this um, couple of uh, boring suits. Two more boring suits. The rest is going to be interesting, I promise. OK, I'll do one more. I just want to have to make sure that this is sealed, OK? This is like I don't want to have any, any in and out going right now in here, just for the safety of this whole thing. There we go. And then one more. And then I'm going to go now to the papilla. Now, for the papilla, I opened another suture, but I could use this one. Depending on the size of the papilla and the, the thickness of the tissue, the phenotype of the patient, I'm going to choose a suture there. And now we have the luxury that I can have all kinds of sutures, so that's perfect. So I want to use probably the most ideal suture there. But now the papilla, as you will see, will not be in the middle. Will be a little bit more towards the, the, the defect. The ridge is closing so nicely, I would say, uh, nicely in terms of like, I could put my finger between the, the soft tissue and the, flat, the, the membrane, so it's really uh, loose, which is good. And now, this papilla is not big, so, but I can still use this. I'm going to use this suture. I go down to the base of the papilla. I'm going to the lingual, and I'm going to grab the vertical incision on the lingual. And I'm going to have a little mirror for that. How long is okay, the lingual vertical here. incision, East one? The lingual vertical incision is short. It's like four millimeters. OK. See, this is what I did. I just grab it. This is a big needle, I know. Um, anyway, I'm going to go back here. And in my experience, you don't really have to worry about that vertical incision. Whatever loop you can get in there is fine. Now I will try to suture to this side of the papilla, 
to this, this side of the popular to try to close already the vertical incision, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work, so I'm going to go now and push with my fingers the popular in here, right? See that? Yeah. I push the popular in here. And this one, I call this the lasso suture, like, you, like a cowboy using the lasso to catch a horse. So I cut the popular, put it back, and now this is open, okay? But now I'm going to switch to different instruments and different sutures. And I'm going to use now a 6-0 nylon suture. 6-0 nylon suture, okay? It's a black color. I prefer the blue, but that's okay. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go obliquely and I'm going to start from the apical, I go up. This is a little bit similar to like a root coverage of a single tooth when you do coronally advanced flaps. Who's doing, uh, you know, a lot of um, connective tissue it's grafts knows this. Okay, and now I'm going to use a different technique to suture. I call this the tail, and call this the needle side. The tail side, I never mix, I never kind of cross my hand. I'm going to put the tail to the other, si the other side. And I'm going to switch now, pull the tail back. And I'm going to take here, now I'm going to, I can use a normal suture, or I can use this mini loop suture, just to give you some more chances to have some questions why I'm doing that. Okay, move. And I leave this, I stretch it, tie, but I did not tighten the, 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 the sutures perfectly together. I'm just going to do this, I'm going to do another one. Okay, so this is going to be very easy to be removed. And they, I mean, in my experience, they, they stay really close. You don't need to use this. You can tighten the knot, but we're doing this for a especially for the aesthetic areas, for the anterior maxilla, I would definitely do this if, we, if I would have a vertical incision in a visible area. That's why I'm showing this to you. Okay, I'm going to do the next one. And you see when I'm in keratinized tissue, but this is going to look really nice. Okay, and I'm just going to go now, switch again hands. Okay, this, this suture is usually taking some time, but I'm trying to do it as quick as possible. Okay, now you can see it more. There it is. Okay, you could not, we could tighten it, but you don't have to. Okay, now you the goal explain, of this, yeah. in the aesthetic zone, not in here, it's not really an aesthetic zone, but I think she's gonna appreciate it, is that this is gonna be like no wrinkles on the tissue and almost invisible vertical incision at the end. Because we, in our clinic, we have to do a lot of vertical incisions for different types of defects. And we, uh, we needed to work, uh, work on something that, you know, it's not my idea, by the way, that will give us a little bit of a better outcome. And I just want to show you, if I am not worried about this suture in, in a ridge augmentation like this, then you should not worry about it either. Okay, it's not beautiful. So this one, the, the rational about not completely tighten it is to give then also the, uh, the flap during the wound healing sufficient space and without having then any scar tissues laid drawn. That's the rational behind that. Yeah. That, that was the original rational, but, you know, I, when I, you know, some people thought that this is going to close up. I've never seen them closing, but they don't open either. So, but definitely there will be much less scarring and lines and not in this case, I mean, in this case now, you know, I'm going to do one more. Then basically we're done. I'm just going to go back and check the ridge. In this case, maybe there will be still a line here. There we go. I'm going to have to adjust that a little bit. And that happens in ridge augmentation that you have to do a little bit of an adjustment. But for okay. the amount of augmentation we have, yes. I think uh, it was a pretty... Uh, you closed it very nicely there, and also this last part of the uh, vertical reasoning station is almost perfect there. There it is. Ronnie, Isabella, for the sake of time, shall we take one more switch to Torino to get the final comments uh, on Mario's case as well, and then uh, okay. try to wrap up? Yeah. Yes, yes, I think. Eastman, we're going to switch to Torino. Let's go to the back.
Okay, already. Okay, Action. you see now that I'm doing the vertical incision with Are the you five fai here, fai O and a small needle. So we use the three, four, and five, depending on uh, the site. Here we want to have a small needle and a small... And you see that it's very well adapted. Mario, I, I can see the patient has undergone orthodontic therapy. How is the patient going to provision? I, how are you going to provisionalize the patient? With, a, with the orthodontic appliance. Okay. He will have two missing teeth bonded to the brackets. Because we have to stress how important it is not to have any pressure on the, yeah. on the surgical area, on the augmented area. But right. This, but this, of course, right. is unusual, provisional. Huh? Yes, of course. So we are always using Essex retainers when yeah. we have extended cases like this to have them too supported and then you don't have any pressure to the wound surface. Very important. Correct. Very important. But also here, I think uh, we really can see how precise the surgery yes. has been performed in order to end up also with a vertical raising incision, which is really yeah, if you ideally wanna, adapted. I'll show you. Oh well, yeah, I'll show you this side, which is probably finished, so you can, uh, if you have to interrupt, uh, you will see that uh, it's precisely future, so it's it should be safe. And now yeah. on the horizontal side, you see one, three zero, two, four zero and then the interrupted suture right here to make sure that it's well adapted. Wonderful. Excellent. I think we well, uh, come to the end. Yes. I think uh, it could not have been better from a timing perspective. This is very difficult to plan, but I think we, uh, we have not just uh, two champions there in terms of surgery, also in terms of time management. Maybe we can, the three of us can quickly wrap up about what we have learned for the audience. Maybe exactly. then you can uh, give us from both sides, what do you think? What are the key points in order to take home for the audience, uh, starting with the, the case from Istvan Urban in Budapest? No. First of all, these both very complex cases, not the routine ones, that in my experience, less than 1% of the patients we treat, but of course, for those who need a solution. Second, both are using composite graft, very important. You need also genic potential, but also volume stability. The third one, of course, is now the big question. Uh, we know from the PTFE that works. Very uh, difficult to do, yes. And with the mesh, uh, here's the question. How often do you get a dehiscence on top of it? If the dehiscence is much better now, then I think it's a very fair, valid uh, alternative uh, to membranes as well. So I think I'm very impressed by the surgical technique. Yes. Uh, very nice principles applied. So, congratulations. I would like to sum up by congratulating both, uh, both surgeons. And uh, what I would like to, to summarize is how impressive the biological principles have been uh, respected in both sides, regardless of the difference in technique, and how precise and meticulous every single part of the surgical protocol has been followed. So, a big thank you from our side. I think to conclude now on that, uh, I think we have really seen a spectacular session here. And uh, I, Mario and uh, Istvan, you from the side here in, uh, in Geneva, we are deeply impressed and uh, we respect what you have done. This is so much pressure and you did it to the last detail. And the only thing what you can do is say a big thank you and a huge applause to the two surgeons there. Thank you, guys. Let's make sure they can hear that all the way in Budapest and in Torino as well. Let's make sure they hear that applause over well. I was just uh, checking the main flyer of this conference. The theme of this Congress is uniting nations through innovations. I think what we have just done here, led by you, Ronnie, Isabella, and Daniel, and together with Isvan and Mario, all the technicians behind the scenes and this wonderful audience in the room, I think we are really living that theme, uniting nations through innovation. So it's time to end this amazing session and wrap up the second day of content here at the EEO Geneva Congress. Thanks to all our experts, thanks to the chairs, and thank to you for joining this session. Thank you.